Hey, well, thank you very much for giving up your evening to come and uh, hear me address this question, if God, um, why suffering? And I guess people come to this question for different reasons. It might be you're here because, um, a bit like Stephen Fry, if you saw um, his interview recently last week, uh, you're angry about God because of this issue of suffering. Um, or maybe you're a philosopher and you think that this is the kind of knockdown argument against God. Uh, you may have heard the words, the famous words of the Scottish skeptic David Hume. He said, were a stranger to drop of a sudden into this world, I would show him as a specimen of its ills, a hospital full of diseases, a battlefield strewed with carcasses, a fleet foundering in the ocean, um, a nation languishing under tyranny, famine or pestilence. He goes on to say, I find it impossible to, to square that with an ultimate purpose of good. Uh, maybe you've heard the argument put this way, if God were all-powerful, he would be able to end suffering. If God were all-loving, he would want to end suffering. But obviously, we live in a world full of suffering, and so an all-powerful, all-loving God cannot exist, QED. And at that point, the philosopher sits back in the armchair or in the lecture um, seat and, and wonders what the Christian will say to get out of that one. It might be you're here just out of philosophical interest. It might be you're here for a, a, an argument or a debate and um, perhaps that's what brought you this evening. Other people, of course, they ask the question, what about suffering? Because maybe, maybe you are suffering. And maybe it's much more than an abstract question for you at the moment. And uh, my job normally, when I'm not here, is to um, lead a church in London. And I guess as a church leader, I get to encounter other people's suffering more than, more than average. Um, so last week, for example, I went on Wednesday to visit a man from my church who has a brain tumour and he's probably going to be dying this week or next week. Um, I spoke on Sunday to another lady about my age, just about 40 or early 40s, who's been diagnosed with um, incurable cancer and she's preparing for her first round of chemotherapy. Um, there'll be other people here who are suffering because of a relationship that's broken down uh, or maybe problems at home or maybe struggles with depression, or whatever it might be. And for you, it's much more than just an abstract philosophical question. It's a personal question. And I hope, can I say, for, that we can all um, treat the subject respectfully for the sake of those people amongst us. I think this isn't just a game. These are serious issues. And as I say, they will affect some of us personally. I want that to be the kind of manner in which we approach it, to be a respectful one. Um, but just before I start, um, I want to say... Um, that Christianity um, won't offer every answer to every situation that you face. And I don't want to pretend it can. One of the things I love about the Bible is actually the honesty um, that it has and the, the permission it gives Christians to ask unanswered questions. Christians are allowed to ask, why? And um, some of the songs in the Bible are addressed to God and are really searching as to why has this happened to me? And you may know that even Jesus famously said those words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And I don't want to pretend that I've got every answer to every problem that you've got, and I certainly don't want to pretend that Christianity will make all your problems disappear and you'll leave here kind of skipping down the, uh, down the road through campus with a rainbow guitar strap and a, and a fixed grin. Um, I don't think Christianity is fake like that. I don't think it will answer every question. However... I am convinced that Christianity, that Jesus offers much better answers than the others that are around. And what I want to do firstly is just give a survey of some of the other philosophies of the world and their answer to the question of suffering and before turning to the teaching of Jesus and seeing what he has to say about it. So firstly, a quick whistle-stop tour of some of the philosophies of the world. Firstly, atheism. Um, for the atheist, suffering is meaningless. Uh, suffering is, is meaningless. Just an accident, just the way in which the atoms of the universe bumped into one another purposelessly several billion years after the universe began by chance. So uh, Richard Dawkins, everyone's favourite atheist, he puts it this way, in a world of blind physical forces and genetic replication, some people are going to get hurt, other people are going to get lucky, and you won't find any rhyme or reason to it, nor any justice. The universe we observe has precisely the properties we would expect 
if there were at bottom no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. Um, for the atheist, the, the world is an accident, human life is an accident, and it doesn't even really make sense to ask why. Uh, why has this happened? Well, the answer is it's accidental. It would be like um, pressing the random number on your scientific calculator because you're bored in a maths lesson, and then saying to your friend, oh, I wonder why it ended in a seven this time. Meaningless question. It might just as well have ended in a four or a, or a three, just the way that the, the dice were thrown today. So to ask as an atheist why, it doesn't really make sense as a question. And actually, all your suffering is is just the change of the concentration of a particular neurotransmitter in the randomly assembled collection of atoms, which is your brain. Um, I know that because my own background was in neuroscience, I did a PhD in neuroscience, and I used to be an atheist, and that was my very cynical view of the world uh, once upon a time. The atheist suffering is meaningless. Uh, then for the Hindu, or for the Eastern religions, suffering is payback. Now that's not the word that people would use. Instead, we would use the much more kind of trendy and hipster word, karma, but translated, basically karma means payback. The idea of the Eastern religions is that there's a kind of balance in the world brought about by endless cycles of reincarnation. So you'll live your life over and over again, and if you lived a good life last time round, it will come out good this time, and if you lived a, a bad life last time round, then you'll get what's coming to you. And so everything's kind of kept in balance, you kind of get what you deserve. It's, it's payback. So what should the Hindu say to the person uh, passing them in a wheelchair? Well, I can see you're getting what you deserved. I'm not saying anyone would, would say it as, as crassly as that, but that actually is the belief system of many, many people in the world. Um, one of my friends um, in London is a, is a GP. She is an Indian doctor. She grew up in India before coming over to work in this country, in the NHS. And she said that people in, in India are much more kind of chilled out about the massive gaps that we find in wealth and in poverty. Because they're kind of at peace with it, they kind of think it, it's kind of fair. If you're poor, if you're untouchable, it serves you right. Bad karma last time round. Payback. Uh, then there's Buddhism. According to the Buddhists, suffering is an illusion. Uh, you may know that Buddhism came about because the, the Buddha, the philosopher, was trying to come to terms with the, the problem of pain. And he came to the insight that we suffer because we form attachments to things and to people. His solution was to break those attachments and isolate ourselves from everything and achieve, and um, finally, to nirvana, this great nothingness where your mind is emptied, and so you'll be kept from suffering. To give you a concrete example, a few years ago, my sister was living in Hawaii. You might think that sounds like a kind of paradise lifestyle, but actually, it was pretty difficult for her because she was in a relationship that, that broke up um, very um, horribly. She owned a business out there, and her partner had um, dumped her, walked out on her, and she just ran. So she just went to the airport, she left everything behind her, livelihood behind, and caught the first plane to San Francisco, which is where you change planes to get to Hawaii from most places. And she got to San Francisco airport and phoned me in tears in the middle of the night. And we were on the phone for about three or four hours, and me pleading with her to come to London, where people that loved her could look after her. Uh, let me tell you, that was a very traumatic night for me, uh, worrying if my sister was suicidal, if I could get her safely back. Uh, just on the phone as she was sobbing. It, it hurt me very much that evening, uh, just as her breakdown had hurt her very much. The Buddhist solution to that, well, it's only because we'd formed attachments. See, if only she'd isolated herself from her partner, then she wouldn't have been susceptible to that kind of pain. Uh, if only I didn't care as much for my sister, then I wouldn't be as susceptible to her pain. And so the solution is to meditate and fill your mind with nothingness and the pain will go away. Now it seems to me, I have to say, that even though Buddhism is very trendy in our culture, it seems to me a very ugly philosophy indeed. A philosophy that, that condemns love really as the greatest evil, I mean it wouldn't put it in those words, but attachments as the greatest danger. 
and nothingness as the greatest good, I think is a very ugly thing indeed. Uh, you may know the books of Oliver Sacks, the neuroscientist. As I say, I used to do neuroscience, and um, he, his books are kind of popular science, and he, he writes up people who have quirky neurological symptoms and turns them into popular books. Uh, so books like uh, The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat, which is a description of a man who actually did that because of um, object recognition, blindness, and so forth. Well, in one of his books, he describes a man who um, was admitted in, in his early 20s to a Buddhist um, order and was praised for the incredible enlightenment he seemed to have achieved as such a young man. Um, he was so detached from everything in his meditation that you could even kind of click your fingers in front of his face and he would register nothing. And people said, well, how amazing it is to have achieved such enlightenment just in his early 20s. Until finally, um, a medic, um, he collapsed, I think, and a medic investigated him. They did a, 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 an MRI scan and discovered he had a massive frontal lobe tumour, which basically the equivalent of a frontal lobotomy had just killed the functional centre of his brain. A philosophy which praises that as enlightenment seems to me a very ugly thing, indeed. Now, I, I'm not going to suggest that Christianity has got all the answers, but I do think those other answers really suck. It's random, meaningless, don't even ask the question, says the atheist. It's payback, you're just getting what you deserve, says the Hindu. It's only because you care too much, says the Buddhist. Detach yourself, and it won't hurt as much. Uh, it seems to me that those answers are profoundly dissatisfying. And that Jesus' answer, well, I've got to warn you, it's going to be more uncomfortable at first, and yet in the long run, much more ultimately hopeful than any of the others. And rather than just giving you kind of my take on Jesus' teaching, and in particular because I have to say, Jesus says things pretty straight, and there's a great temptation for me to kind of water it down or not to give it to you straight. So to, to stop me um, with that temptation, um, I've given, we've, we've distributed amongst you um, a copy of one of the eyewitness documents about Jesus' life um, from the Gospel of Luke. Uh, Luke tells us at the beginning of his book that he investigated everything from the eyewitnesses, from those who actually met Jesus, and has compiled a narrative. And this is taken from um, Luke's Gospel, Luke's account of Jesus' life um, in the New Testament. Um, incidentally, um, tomorrow evening, on our question, who is Jesus, I'm going to look at some of the historical evidence by which that we can trust that documents like this really do reflect accurate eyewitness history. So come back tomorrow if that's your question. But for now, um, here's an account of Jesus' teaching, and it's pretty straight. Um, and we'll, we'll make two points um, from it. So first point, Jesus says that suffering is a sign that we live in a world that's gone horribly wrong, and we must repent. Suffering is a sign we live in a world that's gone horribly wrong. We must repent. Let me just read to you the first half of this page. There were some present at that time who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. Okay, this is an example then of, of suffering due to political tyranny. You may know that Jesus lived in a time when Israel was an occupied country. The Roman Empire controlled Israel. And soldiers prowled the streets um, under the rule of the, uh, of the local governor, Pontius Pilate. And it seems there had been some kind of brutal crackdown on, on local um, pra religious practices. And Pilate had executed the Jews, and their blood had got mixed up with the animal sacrifices that they were offering to God. So it's a horrible, barbaric example of political oppression, such as only too common in the world today also. People asked Jesus about that. Verse 2, Jesus answered... Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too also will perish. Or those 18 who died when the tower in Siloam fell on them. Okay, so this time, suffering because of a, a natural disaster, an earthquake, or maybe um, shoddy building. And in an accident, these 18 die. Do you think that they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you too will all perish. So notice the first thing Jesus says. Jesus doesn't agree with the karma, payback principle. In other words, if you could line all of us in this room up in a, a kind of spectrum, so we put the person who suffered the most over at that end, 
and the person who's lived the easiest life over at this end and everyone else in between on the scale. Jesus is saying that would not correlate or correspond to the people who've lived the best life and the people who've lived the worst life. It just doesn't go like that. You can't tell from how much someone suffered how much God loves them, how good they've been. It just doesn't correspond, Jesus says. I don't agree with karma. Do you think that they were worse sinners? No. Um, do you think that they were more guilty? I tell you no. So Jesus disagrees with karma, but he does have this general warning for us. Unless you repent, and we must repent. To fill you in the background, the Bible says that God made a perfectly good world. Uh, a world that was um, in which we lived in harmony with one another and were designed to live in relationship with our creator. But um, we rejected God and um, decided instead that we wanted to live in, in the world without him. He made the world, he gave us our life and everything, um, but we instead wanted autonomy. No thanks God, I, I just want to carry on without reference to you. And as a result, we made a real mess of the world. We broke our relationship with God, we broke our relationship with one another, a terrible atrocities began to happen, the first murder, the first lie, the first broken promises, and the world descended into the moral chaos that we're in uh, nowadays. And the Bible says that one day, um, God is going to come in judgment and destroy evil. Let's just think for a moment. Imagine that you were God, and that you had to turn this messed up world into a perfect world. You wanted to, to sort out the mess. What would you do to fix this world? Well, obviously, you'd have to get rid of all the things that make this world a mess. You'd have to get rid of all the evil in the world. So, for example, you'd have to get rid of ISIS terrorists. Because if you've got a perfect world, and then people in the world who think that they can advance their political agenda by beheading people on television, that is going to ruin the world again. So you've got to get rid of people like that. You can't have them in a perfect world. You've got to judge evil. But actually, it's easy for us to say, isn't it, well, you've got to get rid of ISIS. But actually, there's also problems closer to home because you'd have to get rid of people who break their promises. Because I reckon broken promises are the cause of almost more pain than anything else in this country. Maybe you've been a victim of it yourself in a relationship where someone's cheated on you. You couldn't have people who would cheat on each other in a perfect world because it would mess the world up. So you'd have to get rid of them. Uh, and selfishness hurts people, doesn't it? Because we advance ourselves at the expense of others. So you'd have to get rid of selfish people in the world. Um, if God is going to do a proper clean-up operation, he's got to get rid of the cause of the problems, which means, amongst other things, he's got to get rid of us. And the Bible says God is committed to destroying evil. There is a judgment day. And the, the trouble in the world now ought to be a wake-up call that something is desperately wrong. Jesus says, unless you repent, you too also will perish. It's amazing, isn't it? It amazes me that um, some philosophers go through this world as if everything was basically okay. You read in the papers, you know, humans are basically good. We don't have a problem that we need fixing with God. We can make our own way. I, I am astonished that we're able still to hold on to that kind of optimism in the face of what you read in the newspapers every day. Not, not just in the Middle East. Uh, one of my friends is a social worker, and um, she gets to see a little bit more of, I guess, the the dark underbelly of human culture that most of us know. She works quite near where I live in London. Let me tell you, some of the things that happen just within a few hundred yards, probably, of where I live would make you sick. Um, this is a world that is desperately in trouble. And suffering in the world, Jesus says, is a, a wake-up call for us. Something is wrong. Something is very, very wrong with the world. Just imagine that um, you went through the whole of your life without experiencing any trouble at all. Um, you lived in a world that was in rebellion against God. One day there'd be a judgment day, but you just didn't realise. Uh, you had the perfect life at school, the perfect family, the perfect relationship, the perfect God, uh, the, perfect, sorry, the perfect job. Um, you had perfect health. 
in your retirement, you played perfect golf. And then suddenly you discover there's a judgment day. And you have to give account to God for your rejection of him. And you never even realised that there was any problem. Because everything had been so lovely. No, says Jesus, when you see a world in which things are wrong, wake up. God is going to judge evil, but you've got to repent because you're part of the problem. Suffering is a sign something's terribly wrong and we must repent. And then Jesus' teaching gets even more unsettling because he says we've got limited time to repent. Uh, Just look at the second paragraph. Jesus told this parable, a man had a fig tree growing in his vineyard and he went to look for fruit on it but didn't find any. So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, for three years now I've been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree and I haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? Sir, the man replied, leave it alone for one more year. Dig around it and fertilise it. If it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, cut it down. Jesus is giving an illustration. He said the, the world's like this tree. It's not producing the good fruit that God might have hoped for. And it really needs to be cut down. You've got to start again with this world. But in Jesus' story, the, the man says, well, look, let's just give a little bit more time. Give it a chance. Give people the opportunity to sort things out with me. Um, But if they don't, judgment will come. We must repent. We have limited time to repent. As I say, a much more unsettling answer, I think, than anything else. And I'd be tempted not to say that to you, so I'm glad that I printed it, so I have to, because that's what Jesus says. But as well as giving this very stark answer, this unsettling answer... Jesus also, alongside it, gives one of the most profoundly comforting, loving, compassionate answers that you will find, I think, anywhere. Let's read on. The very next episode in Luke's account. On a Sabbath, that's a a Saturday, which the the Jewish people take as a special holy day. On a, a Sabbath, Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues, and a woman was there who'd been crippled by a spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and couldn't straighten up at all. Just a little side on that. Um, as I say, I used to be a scientist and I was very, very cynical about claims of, of spirits or demons or that kind of thing in the Bible. I thought, well, how naive. Obviously, they don't understand anything about science. Um, it's interesting, actually, that Luke, who wrote this account, was a, as a doctor in the first century. He makes quite careful distinctions between the different diseases that people have. So he doesn't attribute all illness to, to spirits. Um, he knows the distinction between kind of health illness And uh, in this case, he attributes something to to evil. Again, it's not particularly trendy, I think, amongst um, secularists to believe in evil. But I do wonder, as we look at the world around us, whether it's not us who are a bit naive to think that evil doesn't exist. Um, Luke does believe, the Luke, the author, does believe in evil. Jesus believed in evil. And here is a woman who has been afflicted by evil for 18 years. um, And she's got some kind of spinal manifestation. She can't straighten up at all. Just imagine 18 years. I mean, that's a long time. 18 years ago, um, I was a little bit older than some of you. That's scary, isn't it? I really am that old. Um, 18 years ago was about halfway through my life so far. 18 years ago is probably the beginning of some of your life. And imagine for that entire time, afflicted and suffering uh, with some kind of spinal problem. Jesus saw her He called her forward and said to her, Woman, you are set free from your infirmity. He put his hands on her and immediately she straightened up and praised God. Indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, the synagogue leader said to the people, There are six days for work, so come and be healed on those days, not on a Saturday. The Lord answered him, You hypocrites, doesn't each of you on the Sabbath untie your ox or your donkey from the stool and lead it out to give it water. Shouldn't this woman, a daughter of Abraham, who Satan has kept bound for 18 long years, be set free on the Sabbath day from what bound her? When he said this, all his opponents were humiliated, but the people were delighted with the wonderful things he was doing. Um, My second point, my first point, suffering is a sign that we live in a world that's in trouble, we must repent. Second point, Jesus' power over suffering is a sign that he can bring about a perfect world and we should trust in him. Jesus' power over suffering is a sign that he can bring about a perfect world, and we should trust him. Jesus encounters suffering, and he's able, um, with a a touch, 
to heal the woman who's been ill for 18 years. Actually, it's just one of many incidents like it in the eyewitness biographies, a, bl a man blind from birth, um, another man paralysed for 38 years, um, a daughter of a, a local official who's died. Uh, Jesus uh, gives him his sight, uh, the, the lame man can walk, the little girl is raised from the dead. Um, again, you might be sceptical about that. You think that those kind of things can't happen. Here's one thing that really helps me with the evidence of it. Even Jesus' opponents grant that he does the miracle. Did you notice that as I read it? Very striking. And um, They are cross because Jesus does it on a Saturday. Their understanding of the Jewish law is that you shouldn't uh, work on Saturdays. And they count Jesus touching this woman and healing her as, as doing kind of doctor's work. So they go, you know, you shouldn't have done this. And they're very angry about it. It seems astonishing to me. They, they don't think, hang on a minute, this, this guy's just done an incredible miracle. They go, oh, he's done it on the wrong day of the week. We're very angry. And actually, because of these kind of things, they oppose him. They end up wanting to execute him. But they don't deny that he did the miracle. In fact, him doing the miracle is the very reason that his opponents are so angry because he did it on Saturday. Interesting, isn't it, that even his opponents grant the extraordinary sign. But Jesus' power over suffering is a sign. In other words, it's not just that Jesus promises to heal every ill person throughout history. He, do, he doesn't promise that. Um, Bob, the, the man in our church with a brain tumour, He's getting worse and probably is going to die. He's a Christian, he trusts Jesus, but Jesus hasn't stormed into the hospital to heal him. Uh, Rachel, the lady my age, who's um, got incurable cancer, uh, the doctors expect she'll get worse and die sometime this year, and she probably will. So the claim isn't that Jesus always heals every Christian. The claim is that Jesus did heal people in front of eyewitnesses as a sign of something, as a, as a way of pointing to a reality, giving solid evidence for his claim that one day he can bring about a perfect world. Uh, to understand this, again, I need to just explain a bit of background. Um, the Sabbath, uh, the seventh day of the week, um, um, symbolised for, for Jews in the Old Testament part of the Bible, it symbolised um, God's rest from all of his creation. The first book of the Bible speaks about God creating the world in six days. On the seventh day, he rested. And all the way through Jewish history, they celebrated this, this one day of the week as the kind of goal of creation. Once God had finished creation, this was the enjoyment that it was all pointing forward to, when God could sit back and put his feet up and say, what a wonderful world I've made. But of course, we're not in a wonderful world. We're in a world that got messed up. And so the Sabbath came to symbolize the the perfect future world that God will one day restore. Now, if I told you, you know, don't worry, because Christianity promises you a perfect future world in heaven, you might very well come back and say, well, that's a lovely idea, isn't it? I can see why you'd want to believe that as a kind of psychological crutch, as a kind of perfect pie-in-the-sky optimism for the naive, uh, the opium of the masses. But give me some solid evidence for it, please, if you expect me to believe that. And here is the evidence that Jesus in history proved that he had the power to sort out suffering as a sign that one day he'll be able to do it for the whole world. That's why actually, far from being inappropriate to do it on a, on a Sabbath, is actually kind of the point. Jesus says, shouldn't this woman, a daughter of Abraham, Satan has kept bound for 18 long years, be set free on the Sabbath day? How appropriate that on the day that you look forward to a perfect world, I prove to you that I have the power to, to deliver on it. Well, um, Jesus, of course, his ultimate proof was his own death. And three days later, his resurrection from the dead. His proof that he could fix even the ultimate suffering that comes from the grave and bereavement and separation from somebody that you love. Even that he can beat. So to summarise um, where we've got to, Jesus says that suffering is a wake-up call. We live in a world that's in desperate trouble. Something is desperately wrong and we must repent 
please take it seriously and get sorted out with God before his judgment comes. But secondly, that God's Jesus' power over suffering is a sign that he has the power to fix suffering. We should put our trust in him. And then wonderfully, the um, Gospel of Luke ends with Jesus himself suffering, identifying with our suffering on the cross as he was executed barbarically by the Roman, op- 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 um, the Roman occupying forces. And then him beating death in his resurrection. And then him telling his followers that it was predicted, prophesied, that the Christ had to suffer and be killed. And three days later be raised from the dead. So that repentance and forgiveness of sins in his name could be preached to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. Jesus' death, his ultimate suffering for our sins, his resurrection, his ultimate conquest of suffering, will give me the opportunity as a Christian to offer you this evening a new start in a perfect world with your slate wiped clean, with judgment day no longer to be afraid of, uh, with your ticket to heaven guaranteed. Thank you very, very much for listening, and I look forward very much to your questions. I believe they're just opposite. So if that was you, do sneak out unretrievably. Okay. Why was Jesus the perfect sacrifice? Um, why was Jesus the perfect sacrifice? Um, I guess the person asking that question has got kind of some understanding already. So let me just fill in for you. Um, All the way through um, the first part of the Bible, the Jewish history, um, God explained to his people, the Israelites, that forgiveness wasn't cheap. So I think sometimes people say today, look, you know, if God's a forgiving God, why can't he just forgive people? Why the need for sacrifice or anything like that? Surely God can just, you know, he tells us to turn the other cheek, surely he can turn the other cheek. But the problem is that if I just let you off, you know, imagine you stamp on my foot or something, I'm a bit cross about it, but then I say, look, let's just let it go. That's okay. In fact, that's quite a commendable thing to do for me to let things go. But it's okay because I don't control the moral fabric of the universe. If God um, says to evil things, oh, I'll turn a blind eye to that, never mind, it's more serious. So, you know, imagine there's a judge even in a human court and um, in his courtroom comes a rapist, and they look at the evidence and the DNA, whatever, say, yeah, it's definitely, definitely it was rape. But, you know, I'm a c- compassionate, forgiving kind of judge. I think I'll let it go. You know, you can go free. Now, that actually, we don't say, oh, what a forgiving judge. We say, what outrageous injustice. Because we know that when it's not just individuals, when it's people responsible for the moral fabric of society, it actually matters that... Um, consequences due um, consequences are, are meted out and if that's true of human judges it's even more true of God imagine God said you know Hitler turns up at the pearly gates and God says well you know I know you gassed a lot of Jews but I'm a forgiving kind of God come in well then God would be saying good and evil doesn't matter to me I don't make a distinction between them and that would actually be very very serious for the kind of universe we live in so um, actually for God Justice is very important, and forgiveness isn't cheap or easy. And one of the ways that he tried to convey this um, in the years before Jesus came to the Israelites was by um, prescribing costly sacrifices to deal with wrongdoing. So um, if you um, committed some kind of um, wrongdoing before God, some kind of wrongdoing against your neighbour, you needed to make atonement for that by going to the temple with a sacrifice And it was like the the blood of the animal kind of symbolically cleansed you from the moral dirt that you had accumulated. Now, of course, it didn't actually work that way because an animal isn't really a fit swap for what you did as a human. But it was a kind of symbol, again, to point to something to come. Now, um, one of my friends gives the analogy of, um, let's say you've done something wrong and somebody else is offering to pay. Um, So, you know, you say um, you got a detention at school. 
and you say, look, you say to the teacher, if I can find somebody else to pay for me, can I get off the detention? And the teacher thinks this is quite an amusing idea because he thinks, you know, fat chance you'll find anyone. So he goes, okay, fair enough. If you find a substitute, then they can pay. And so, um, firstly, you say, well, can Bruno sit the detention for me? Who's Bruno, says the teacher? My dog, you say. And the teacher says, your dog can't sit the detention because he's a dog. You know, that, he's not a fair swap for, for you. Um, and then you say, okay, fair enough. And then you say, um, can... Um, can my mate Pete, he's there in the rugby shirt, can he sit the detention for me? The, the teacher says, no, he can't, because Pete's got a detention himself. He's already in detention. <laughs> okay, sorry about that, Pete. So the only kind of person who could pay for you as a swap would have to be a like-for-like -like swap, another human being, not just a dog or something, and they'd have to be innocent themselves. And those are the criteria that Jesus meets that make him the perfect sacrifice. He is another human being, a real man, and yet he was innocent. He never did anything wrong. And so when he offered his life in a swap for ours, I'll be the sacrifice. I'll pay the consequences that God ought to require of you for your sin. Uh, that was a fitting sacrifice. And amazingly, in his great love, he chose to do that. I'll be saying more about that on Friday if you can come back, about the death of Jesus and why it was necessary. But thank you. Great question. Next. Yeah, question. Um, I understand the human element of a broken world, but what about the physical, like, natural disasters? How do they represent a broken world? Thanks very much. Now, that's a really good question. And um, I wonder if you notice, just in Jesus, the two, the two questions Jesus is asked, or the two issues people bring to Jesus, is actually one of each. So the first instant is people who have been, I guess, violently murdered by a, a political tyrant, those whose blood Pilate mixed with their sacrifices. But then there's a situation where a tower collapses. So it, Jesus isn't only answering questions about, you know, suffering caused by moral evil. He's also talking about things that, suffering that's caused by just things going wrong in the world. But interestingly, he answers both questions in the same way. Um, to give a fuller answer to that, um, another place in the Bible says, and well, I'll, just, I'll read it to you. Um, uh, it talks about the creation being subjected to futility. Um, not willingly, but because of the one who subjected it. Um, the, the Bible's picture is that when human beings rebelled against God... Uh, the consequences were more than just for human beings. So, you know, some of the consequences are obvious, aren't they? If I reject God, then I'm going to feel quite detached in this world from my creator. I might have things like, you know, who am I as a human being? Because I've stopped believing that there was a God who made me. I might have things like, you know, a, a crisis about my future. Where am I going as a, Christian, as a human being? Because I've stopped believing in the God who has purposes for me. So some of the consequences are obvious, just as a result of this relationship being broken. But the Bible says that that relationship being broken with, with the God who made me has then repercussions in all other kind of areas. So it has repercussions to my relationship with other people. Um, if I've rejected God and I'm trying to run my life my own way, and you've rejected God and you're trying to run life your own way, then when we bump into each other, he's going to be in charge. We both decided that God won't be in charge, we will. But then we've got two kind of competing little gods, me and you. He's going to win. And so we fight each other. And so a broken relationship with God means broken relationships with other people. And the Bible says even it means a broken relationship with the creation, with the, the physical order. Now, that we find that hard to understand because we think, um, you know, the physical order is just atoms and we're just advanced, evolved accidents. But actually, in the Bible's conception of the world, God intended human beings to play a central role in the universe. And when we go wrong, the whole of the, the physical universe goes wrong. And so I would say things like tsunamis and natural disasters and diseases and cancers are all signs that the, the whole cosmic world has gone wrong, which Jesus is a repercussion of our relationship with God going wrong. And conversely, he says that when he fixes our relationship with God, then he'll fix the creation. And the two things go together. And so the world that, that we're looking forward to as Christians, that you're invited to, if you'll put your trust in Jesus, will be a world of restored relationship with God, restored relationships with other people, 
and a restored relationship with the, with the created order. You described Buddhism and atheism as cruel, but surely Christianity is also cruel because only Christians will go to heaven. Okay, thank you. Um, Christianity is cruel because only Christians will go to heaven. Um, I, my, I think my answer to that being uncruel would be everyone is invited to be amongst our number. So, you know, if I were to say, you know, because I'm six foot two, I'm going to heaven, and sorry if you're shorter than me, that would be cruel. Or because I'm a bloke, I'm going to heaven, I'm sorry that you're a woman or whatever, that would be cruel. Um, but actually, the Bible describes Jesus' um, death as a rescue mission that will be offered to everyone. So that, that, that verse I ended with again, I said, um, uh, I'll actually I'll read it to you rather than misquoting it. So the very, very end of Luke's account of Jesus' life, I'm sorry it's not on the page that you have, but it's the very, very end of the account. Uh, it says this. Um, Jesus said, Thus it's written, the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead. So he himself faces the ultimate suffering. He himself beats suffering in resurrection. And as a consequence, repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to every nation beginning at Jerusalem. That's why we're here today. You know, God is offering to students at Royal Holloway, whatever your background, uh, a new start and forgiveness. So, yes, only... I mean, so saying only Christians is almost a bit of a circular... It's almost a bit tautologist. It's like saying only people who've accepted the offer of forgiveness have accepted the order of forgiveness, the offer of forgiveness. A Christian is just someone who said yes to that offer. And you could say yes to that offer. If you say no to that offer, well, then you've got to, you know, fight your own fight on Judgment Day, and it's it won't be a happy day if you're if you're part of the problem of the world, which I think all of us are. But it's on offer to everyone. So um, I think that's God's generosity, and I'm pleased. Take it seriously, as a, as we're amongst those who've been privileged to receive that news. Great. This question says, "I was abused by an ex and messed around by others in past relationships." Surely it's better to remain cold-hearted and distant in future relationships to avoid getting hurt rather than get attached and get hurt again. Yeah, I mean, it's, so, it's, it's horrible. I'm really, I, can, I can understand that. I relate to that. Um, and I think that, you know, that's the kind of sad pragmatism, isn't it, of the person who thinks um, the least painful future is to love and trust nobody. And in a in a kind of horribly messed up world, I can see why you might conclude that. Um, I, think, I think one of the things I can offer you is that Jesus won't do that to you. I can't promise you a, a human being won't. I can't even promise you that Christians won't. I think Christians are, well, Christians that I know have their lives shaped progressively by the teaching and, and power of Jesus. So I, I, ha- I am a privilege to be in a Christian community where I do experience people who are trustworthy and kind and fair. And that, that's been my experience of the Christian community. But Christians are still humans who are going to make mistakes. So it's, it's even possible that you've been in a church where people have wronged you or let you down. And it's possible in the future you'll be in a church where people will. So I can't give you that guarantee, even amongst Christians, but I can give that guarantee about the Lord Jesus. And because he was somebody who never broke his promises. He was never selfish. And he never ditched people. He never lied to people. And so that's one of the things I think why relationship with him is so precious. Because you can risk putting your life in his hands. I remember when I first became a Christian. I was um, in my first year at university. I, I'd been an atheist. I was facing the decision about whether to become a Christian. And often people think it's a, is it true or not decision? It was for me to start with, it was that, you know, is Christianity true or is it make-believe? Is it scientifically naive? Is it a historically a fairy tale? So I had those kind of intellectual questions. And as I looked into it, I discovered, I, I'm convinced it makes scientifically more sense than atheism does. It's historically convincing. Um, I thought, it's probably true. That was the way my thinking was going. And so you'd think, well, obviously, you're going to become a Christian then. If you decided Christianity is true, you'll be a Christian. But actually, no, I didn't become a Christian because my other question was, will Christianity wreck my life? 
It might be true, but what if it's true and rubbish? You know, what if following Jesus will make me a kind of grey, lifeless, um, anti-fun kind of person? That was my fear. And I remember um, you know, the final thing for me, the final barrier, was being convinced not just that it was true, but that Jesus was good, uh, that I could trust him. And I remember that day that I was saying, basically, I'm going to repent. I'm going to say to Jesus, you can be in charge of my life. And I'd never given anyone control of my life before in that kind of absolute way. I'd rest, I rested the controller out of my parents' hands, as you do as a teenager, and I wasn't ready to give it up quickly. And I remember thinking, this is a very scary thing to say to somebody, you can be in charge of my life. And the question then is, is he good? And, and I'd love you to read one of the accounts of Jesus' life. We've got some for you to take away if you'd like to just hear. Um, read it to discover if it's true, but also read it to find out what kind of person Jesus is and whether you think you could trust him. And, and I think you can. Hey, um, well, look, I don't know. Um, I don't know some of these things about. I mean, that's that's a difficult question. Um, I do know. Again, it goes back to my last answer about God's character, that He is just and good. Um, I trust Him based on His character to do the right thing and the kind thing. Um, and um, I think one of the one of the things that I take some comfort in is I think that God is powerful to change people's thinking not simply by kind of super intellectual means Um, I think it's possible to be a Christian as a intellectual person, some of the cleverest people I know are Christians, one of my mates from Cambridge is a (coughs) professor of material science at Imperial and he's only a year older than me which is just ridiculous he is like the cleverest person I've ever met Um, and he's a Christian, so it's possible to be a serious intellectual and be a Christian but for many people being a serious intellectual is a kind of barrier, not because Christian doesn't make sense, but because we just refuse to change our minds about things. The, the humility required to say, I, I was wrong about the world, and I've got to change my mind, and Jesus was right. For some intellectual people, it's a real barrier. And, and, and one of them, I, I can think of some people I know who, and there's a guy in our church, for example, who's very severely autistic, and you know, very severely autistic, and all kinds of struggles with his family, but he knows and trusts Jesus because he doesn't have some of that kind of baggage and pride about it that others have. So I think think God can deal very kindly uh, with people who are mentally incapacitated, and sometimes we don't have the great advantage of them that we think um, if our pride becomes a barrier. But yeah, uh, who knows? Otherwise, I I think I just trust God to be good and fair. right, we'll make this the last question. If God will end suffering, why doesn't he end it now? Yeah, that's a really, really good question. Um, can I just grab again that, that sheet? Because actually the answer to that question is in the reading that we looked at. And it's this story about the tree again. So um, you remember that the story is that here's a tree that's not producing fruit. It's no good. It needs to be cut down. And the, the man argues, well, look, give it another year. Give it a bit more time and see if it does. And if not, then cut it down. And Jesus, that's the picture of the world that we're in. Judgment day is coming, but God's delayed it. Why the delay? To give people the opportunity to sort things out. To give you the opportunity to hear this talk, uh, engage with the teaching of Jesus, think about these things very seriously, and repent. If judgment day had been yesterday, there'd be some people in this room who wouldn't have been ready for it. Uh, You wouldn't have accepted the forgiveness that Jesus offers you for free. So God's patient. He left it another 24 hours. Here we are. And maybe he'll leave it another two years. Here will be two years' time. But the Bible says he has decided that eventually the day will come when enough's enough. And I I imagine God, I mean, sometimes people say, look, if God really cared, he'd do something about this. I imagine kind of God in this terrible predicament that he desperately wants to end evil. Now, you think that you're offended by evil on the television, how offended do you think the God who made life and who created us to love him and love each other, how do you think he feels about it? 
You know, God is unimaginably distressed about evil in the world, and he longs to end it. But when he ends it, it's too late for those who are evildoers to, to change sides, to put their trust in him, to ask for his forgiveness through Jesus' death on the cross. And so God's in this kind of dilemma, and so far his patience wins. He goes, I'll wait a bit longer. Um, I'll give him a bit more time. But Jesus says, don't be deceived, the day is coming. It will come when God says, right, I'm calling time on the world. Judgment day, end of evil, too late. And so I would say, make the best of the time. You, you are living in God's gracious delay. Make the best of the opportunity um, to get things right with him. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Andrew, for coming to the